Welcome, everybody, back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY in Manhattan, in New York City, at the City University, another day on the planet Earth. The sun shines outside, but still the reality is stranger than fiction. We live in a catastrophe movie here, especially in the US, uh, where the situation is so dramatically different than what we just heard from our friends and colleagues from France or from uh, from uh, Germany, um, Susanna Kennedy said that she feels it's almost over. And uh, but here, over 40 states seeing uh, rising uh, numbers. Uh, Florida had the highest number of cases of death ever, and uh, uh, school systems are closing down for the entire fall. The Los Angeles school system, and also my university, I think, will cough completely online uh, teaching as a course with the possibility to do a hybrid courses. We are all very happy that our international students can stay. It looked like they would be banned to enter the country, a shocking uh, proposal and reckless uh, uh, from, from the Trump administration. And uh, we hope things will look better soon. There are so many uh, efforts by scientists around the world to find a cure. And there are important news about the vaccination, but we hope it will, um, it will be found ne never in the history of mankind. So many scientists have worked together. And as we hear, the Russian hackers are trying to get it to every lab. It was just uh, the big news today and uh, around the world to get the information. So it is like, a, it is really like an incredible um, uh, catastrophe movie, which, which we are looking at. And the voices of artists, we feel strongly at the Siegel Theater. And we have always thought about this, but now it becomes even clearer. The voices of artists are of significance now more than ever. Artists have been on the right side of social justice, the right side on that complex struggle for freedom and liberties over centuries. And, uh, and uh, what they think, what they anticipate, how they feel the present is most significant. And we need to listen to them more as we need to listen to scientists and our climate uh, 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 researchers. But artists do know uh, what we do need and what is missing and they are right in what they say. So this is why we, uh, continue our work uh, uh, to listen around the world. Uh, we are now in week 15 or 16. Incredible. We didn't know it would be so long when we started it. Five days a week, we do a new program. And as far as we know, we're the only theater institution in the US or even in, in, in Europe that have no programming every day did connected to, to that. It's a small center where we are. And uh, today we have uh, another artist with us who deserves our attention, who is a significant force in the field whose work is emerging and it's uh, Tiago Rodriguez so from Portugal Tiago thank you thank you thank you from uh, oh, for, you. for joining us uh, so many told me you should have him on and he hasn't been in the US in the bigger cities but even so as he said he was in Seattle and Cincinnati which is great news that the, these decentralized structure seems to be working and uh, Tiago started out as an actor uh, early on created his own uh, company as a student, uh, TG Sten, and then moved on to do, create a new ensemble, Mundo Perfeito, if I understood it right, uh, in uh, Belgium. And he created a body of work that is a stunning place, uh, works. He created uh, the ones most known as uh, By Heart. Um, uh, he teaches audience members uh, Shakespeare sonnet on life. Uh, it's about memory and history. Uh, Antony and Cleopatra, Bovary, The Way She Dies, if I understand right, it's about Anna Karenina, Karenina. A famous play that got a lot of attention, Sopro, about the idea of the prompter, a woman who has to negotiate with four actors and words and memory and, um, and, uh, and uh, many, uh, many others. He is mixing true, real, stories and quotation marks and fiction he is writing for and with actors which is interesting and uh, and his idea is a poetic transformation of reality through theater he got a very big and significant award in 2018 not long ago the european prize for theatrical realities a very significant one the 15th i think uh, he is the director of the Teatro Nacional de Maria in Lisbon and Portugal since 2015. And he also teaches, I think, in Ana uh, Teresa de Kersmacher School, for example, which, which she runs as a dancer. So he is an educator also and a teacher. So Tiago, um, 
I hope you forgive my long introduction. It is all about listening here, but uh, we, we have to give a little bit of context. So first of all, uh, really, I know how busy you are and that taking the time for us uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, means the world to us. Where are you now and what time is it? Uh, well, I'm in Lisbon. I'm, uh, I'm home uh, right now. Um, normally, I should be at the National Theatre, but uh, we, we had a, um, a turmoil this week. We reopened the theatre uh, late in June, the 20th of June. We reopened the theatre after uh, three and a half months of closure because of the pandemic. And, um, and we've been performing in the theatre, but also uh, open air uh, in the city, in other cities. Uh, so we, we sort of uh, put all our energy in following all the you know, security guidelines and limited amounts of audience and social distance and masks and all the, all the rules. Uh, but we wanted to, as soon as possible, get back to the physical contact with the audience. Um, unfortunately, um, after we did the last of our shows, this sort of summer, short summer season, um, after the last one, we, we, we had a, a case of uh, COVID identified in our team of the National Theatre. So last Monday, we had to, you know, shut down all rehearsals, uh, shut down all works in the building um, and uh, and everybody's been home until this morning so we we were we had a lot of uh, 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 people suspected of covid everybody's been tested and fortunately this one case is an isolated case and the other 150 people that work at the national theater uh, are now negative and uh, are being followed and um, so I, I just got the news uh, a short while ago, it's it's five o'clock uh, in the afternoon in Lisbon. I just knew about it before we started our conversation, so I didn't have time to go back to the theater. But uh, tomorrow morning, I'll I'll be back to the theater along with most of the team, and um, and and sort of facing this this new set of rules of the game um, of uh, of working in uh, well of working that everybody is dealing with. You know the, this sort of common danger, but also uh, in, in Portugal, I, I heard you describing at the beginning what's going on in the United States. And we, we are, of course, watching, uh, following the situation from, from Portugal with a lot of concern because um, we, we feel that it's, it's um, yeah, it's really a catastrophe and, and we're very concerned with, with, with the American people and with everyone living in the United States and also with what seems to be a sort of clash of, uh, of uh, interests be between the safety of the people and, um, and, uh, and other uh, less significant and valuable interests. Um, so we, we watch also the political turmoil around the pandemic in the United States with a lot of, a lot of concern. The same with Brazil. We're very concerned with Brazil. Uh, I have been in Brazil. I was in Brazil in, in March. When the, when the pandemic started and we, we rushed back to Portugal because most theaters were already closing in Sao Paulo. And, um, and we also watched with a lot of concern and, 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 uh, yeah, and worry, not only at the, at the human level because of the safety of the people, but also the political uh, evolution that we see uh, concerning the pandemics in the position of the administrations of the countries. Here in Portugal, the situation was very, uh, under control for a long while. We were a sort of uh, a southern miracle in, yeah. in Europe. Um, and now, not so much. So now what we have is a very controlled situation in most of the country, but not in Lisbon. And that's due in a way to the fact that after the confinement, uh, getting back to work in Lisbon, you have the most uh, uh, amount of people, you have the most density of, of, of people, but also you have the most people having to uh, commute, going from the suburbs to, um, to the center of the city and using public transportation and having absolutely to work for their, for their uh, you know, for their survival. And, um, and then of course you watch that the labor conditions and the uh, ha habitation conditions and working conditions of these people uh, allow for, for contamination. So in Lisbon, we are not so uh, confident and safe anymore. Uh, I think there is a big effort to, to avoid 
going back to confinement, but the numbers uh, specifically in Lisbon are not uh, are not very positive for the moment. The rest of the country is quite under uh, under control and quite safe. Um, so we're really dealing with that situation now, but uh, very eager to uh, you know to be able to go back to rehearsals, go back to preparing the next season. We will open the season the second of this of September um, on on the National Theatre. So we have sort of one month and a half of preparation until we we reopen our our doors and we work daily with the presence of the audience so uh uh well hopefully things will get back better in the next six weeks and um and we will be in a in a sort of kinder context mm. incredible so what were you doing in brazil i think milo rao also happened to be in brazil with his project um what milo, milo he was researching in, in the Amazon. Yeah. Uh, I was taking part uh, at the same time, more or less, but it's a big distance. When we say yeah. Brazil, it's a bit like saying yeah. the States. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were both in the States at the same time. Um, and then you realize someone was in Florida and, and the other one in Nebraska. So yeah. I, it, what were you doing? Would you remember what happened? How did you hear the news? And uh... Yeah, I was taking part in a, in a beautiful festival in Sao Paulo, Meet. It's, uh, it's one of the... The, the most adventurous, uh, uh, interesting, uh, uh, and diverse uh, performing arts festivals in, in Brazil. Um, it's, it's spelled MIT, MIT, uh, São Paulo. And, um, and it had a beautiful international programmation. And I was fortunate enough to be, the, for this edition, the focus artist. So I, I, I was performing more than one piece. I was performing by heart, which is the solo you mentioned, where I, I share uh, the stage with 10 audience members that uh, choose themselves to come on stage to learn a text by heart during the performance, a Shakespeare sonnet, uh, sonnet 30, went to the sessions of sweet silent thoughts, I summon up remembrance of things past. And, and, um, and I was also performing Sopro, which would be performed for the first time in Brazil. I still perform the first three performances of uh, the first three showings of uh, By Heart, but Sopro, we never managed to show it because uh, the, the problem started to happen. Also in Sao Paulo, theater started to close. And uh, in the meanwhile, we were uh, from the other side of the Atlantic in contact with Lisbon because we were about to uh, be forced to close the National Theater also in Lisbon. So this was mid-March and we ended up not doing all the shows we want to do in, in Brazil and coming back to Lisbon and, and facing the fact that uh, the, the, we had closed already the National Theater um, and we were at that point still uh, unaware of the huge dimension of this of this uh, phenomenon of this pandemics and how it would affect us all we were hoping that it would be well a couple of weeks and things will will be sort of solved um and and uh, and quickly when the, we understood that was not the case and that uh, um we were facing a, a sort of long-term phenomena that would have a, a deeper impact in our lives mm -hmm. So then you went right away in confinement, and how long was it? And how, for you, how did you experience it? How, what did it mean to you? Well, in, in Portugal, we uh, half March we entered immediately in state of emergency, and that meant uh, uh, that the right of uh, circulation was uh, suppressed for health reasons. It meant that people should stay home and only leave home for absolutely essential tasks. Um, so that was the halt in, in, in the economy, in the, in, 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 you know, in the work of, of people. Um, and it was very violent for, for the cultural sector. Um, we don't have, uh, like uh, in, in many other countries, I think also like in the States, uh, contrary to Germany or France, we don't have a very uh, um, uh, developed uh, social security plan for artists or uh, culture or arts uh, professionals and workers. So uh, we, we knew that uh, um, social security would not, would not work uh, in favor of artists that could not work, so they were not getting paid and they would not get any, 
any support or very little support from, from the state. So our first decision when we closed the theater was to keep on paying everyone, not only our team, the fixed contracted uh, uh, hired team of the National Theater, but all independent artists, all independent technicians and companies with whom we work, we decided that as long as we would be closed, we would pay full 100% everyone as if uh, work was being presented to the audience. So that was, that was a big strain in our budgets. And at the same time, it was a sort of political decision of assuming that the impact of this crisis should be collective and not individual. That it, they sh people should not feel the impact of this crisis at dinner table. It should be the National Theatre uh, feeling this collective uh, impact uh, because uh, we're a collective, we're a democracy and we're a society. So uh, as long as we can, we should you know, take care of each other. So uh, I think the first reaction to the pandemics because I had to deal as a, a director of the National Theatre with this issue, with, uh, with a very fragile, precarious economical sector in the arts in Portugal, and the place of responsibility of a National Theatre was uh, um, a moderate amount of solidarity, was to say that the first answer we should give as uh, citizens, but also as human beings and artists to this pandemic should be a moderate amount of solidarity. When I say moderate amounts is because we live in, 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 in systems, in societies that are pretty much ruled by market rules uh, and, uh, and they tell us that solidarity is okay but moderate solidarity, like within the, the boundaries of, of reason. And, uh, uh, and I thought immediately and, and I, I was followed by the whole team of the National Theatre that in such a you know, uh, new crisis we should answer with the un uh, unreasonable amount of solidarity and go as far as we could and beyond. So that was the first thing and that really affected me because uh, the first weeks of uh, state of emergency and confinement I spent on, on Zoom meetings and phone calls with artists, with technicians, with uh, partners, with other theatres, finding solutions to all the shows we had to cancel, to all the tours we had to cancel, all the rehearsals we had to cancel. And the answer was always a moderate amount of solidarity. That's how to deal with it. How can we do it? Just be, you know, very, uh, uh, very uh, um, cooperative and, and very gener generous and very, uh, uh, and as fair as you can. And, and uh, you know, and, and that, was, that was very beautiful to, to live like that. Um, so the fact that I was in a place of, let's say, political, in the broader sense of the word, responsibility for others, uh, and especially for artists and, and, and the artistic theatrical landscape, um, forced me to react to the pandemics with some, you know, with some values, with some philosophical stands, and this was solidarity. And that really gave me, um, gave me hope during the first weeks as an individual, because of course, when you do that, you, you feel that solidarity is also contagious. So you feel that other theaters started to react upon that and say, yeah, yeah, if you do that, I'm gonna do it also. And I, wanna, I, I will use the National Theater as an example so that we also do the same. And artists started to demand the same amounts of solidarity from other institutions, from, other, from the state itself. And that was, that was very positive for a, for a long while until um, another, issue of the pandemics, which was, I felt very strongly, which was the, the way that uh, the ability of imagining tomorrow or the future was stolen from us. This sort of um, huge piano that fell in our heads saying, tomorrow doesn't belong to you. You can't, you can't put things in an agenda and really believe they're gonna happen. Um, and, and how that had also an artistic uh, impact. Um, I should say that I spent many, many hours every day working as an artistic director, dealing with calendars, budgets, ideas of other people's performances and, and projects. But uh, I had myself to, to write because I could not rehearse the piece I should be rehearsing. So I, I, I said to myself, well, if you can't rehearse and meet the people, at least you should write. And I, I, must, uh, I must confess that for two months, I wasn't able to write one line of dialogue for a play. I was able to write articles on the pandemics, articles on, on cultural policy, uh, to debate a lot, but 
really write a line for an actor to say on stage was not possible for me. And then one day, um, already in April, two months later, I was talking with this amazing poet from Portugal, Ana Luisa Amaral, uh, from the city of Oporto. And we were talking on the phone and I was sort of complaining a bit like, oh, this is awful, I can't write. I'm working like hell, but th there's nothing juicy, really creative coming out of this. It's just anguish. Um, and, and she said like, well, me too. I, I, it's been two months, I'm clothed at home. You should say I would have written like, you know, an epic poem already. And I, I haven't written one single line of a, of a poem. Um, and then she reminded me of this beautiful quote of Woodsworth, the, the romantic poet, the English poet, who said that poetry, um, well, this, this won't be correct, this quote, but it, could, it will be close. Um, poetry is what we remember. Um, it's the strong emotions we remember in, uh, in quiet times. So this idea that poetry, uh, of course, is fed by the big events of our life, of our collective history, but it will only emerge in the quiet times when we reflect upon the, the you know, we, you don't write a poem in the roller coaster. You write a poem later that day when your balance is back in place and you're not screaming anymore. And she said, like, now, you, now we're screaming. We have no tranquility, no quietness for the poem to emerge. So, you know, uh, live this as good as you can and then start doing theater, uh, not forgetting what happened to you during this period. That's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's quite significant. So poetry is to remember in the quiet time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, one, one thing that happens, and I was at the beginning, I was always talking about, you know, budget and calendar. We would just wanted to save everyone, put everyone on the on the raft, and you know, get through the storm. And uh, after a while, <laughs> I started thinking, but what about you know the artistic uh, substance of what we're living? And I started asking, you know, the, a company who was going to uh, you know, stage Top Girls by Carol Churchill, or another company who's going to stage uh, Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller, or, or another company who's going to stage, uh, I don't know the title in English, Praça dos Heróis, the Thomas Bernard's, um, the, the, the Square of Heroes by yeah. Thomas Bernard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and, um, and I, I started asking them, well, now that this is happening, you know, you had this idea back in January or even in 19. But now that this is happening, do you still want to do these shows later this year or in the beginning of 21? And everybody, every single artist and company I was working with, Portuguese, French, you know, German, uh, Swiss, uh, uh, they all said the same thing. Of course I do. I will just do it differently. Um, and I find this very beautiful. I had to think of, uh, you know, the Indian writer Arundhati Roy. She says... Uh, yeah that we always go back to the, the great stories, the myths. We don't go back for them to be different because we know them already, like in, 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 in the Greek tragedy, but we go back to see what details have changed because it's in the details that your time and your singularity and your vision might be expressed. It's not the fact that Antigone dies or doesn't at the end of Sophocles' tragedy that will be the sign of our times. You know, the zeitgeist won't be in saving Antigone. It will be in how does she die this time around? And, and uh, I, I had to think of that, that all these artists wanted to, even people who were writing new texts or who were not working with text, with devised uh, theater, but they all wanted to keep their concepts they, they, they just assured me that the storytelling would be different. Details would be different. Um, and this I, I found very, very inspiring. I think um, that uh, uh, these pandemics didn't change the world. Uh, what's, what's happening is that it might allow us through all the suffering, which is, you know, catastrophic, but it might allow us to look at it differently and thus talk about it differently. And, and, and I had this sort of reassurance from artists uh, when they say, well, I, I still want to do Carol Churchill. I think it's still relevant, 
I will just tell the story differently now. Hmm. Hmm. So did, did you, do you feel something in you changed in this time um, or you, was it, is it reinforcing what you think about theater live poetry? We have a, um, a great Portuguese poet, uh, José Tolentino Mendonça, who is also, he's a cardinal also, and he's the archivist of the Library of the Vatican. He's an, an amazing figure. And José Tolentino Mendonça, during the, the, you know, the heights of the confinement in Portugal, he wrote uh, that the pandemic, the virus, uh, um, raises the veil. It allows us to look with more clarity at problems. So it, the virus didn't create inequality, but it allows us to look at it more clearly, to shed light upon inequality. But it also allows us to shed light upon collective hope um, and the ability to cooperate, for instance. But whatever we find through the virus is not new, it's just enhanced by the, the urgency or the despair or the hope of our times. And the fact that the virus does this, this kind of tabula rasa that unites us all in, in for better or for worse, like in marriages. Uh, so, so in a way, there's this uh, sense of, uh, of community that I feel now, for instance, with the American people, when I see the news or I read the news, I, 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 um, there's this sense of shared suffering. I know what exactly what people are going through because we're all going through the same thing. Um, and, I, and I think this will allow us <clears throat> we're combative enough to uh, find new tools for um, a more just society. It will also allow, you know, it will pave the way for an even more savage capitalism and more exploitation of, uh, of people. But, uh, but I think uh, it will also allow for a more clear vision of, uh, of the inequalities in our society. And I think that's, that's one of the consequences, the raising this sort of veil uh, that sometimes uh, uh, allowed us to look the other way um, uh, from, from injustice. So, so when, uh, I, I think that's, that's the main thing in this phenomena. It's uh, Bruno Latour, the, the French thinker, he also talked about a general rehearsal. Well, I find this very beautiful uh, that he says this because it's a very theatrical approach to looking at the pandemic. It, this is a general rehearsal of the, of the performances yet to come uh, provoked by climate change. Of course, this is not immediately connected, but there's this idea that it is a global catastrophe. Um, and this is preparing us maybe, uh, giving us this one shot in this rehearsal to learn the lessons we need for, for the opening of the show when we, when we will face more of these phenomena provoked by climate change, which are unfortunately appear to be inevitable. So uh, this idea of raising the veil or general rehearsal, for me, they, they talk a, a lot about past and future. Raising the veil, for me, it's about thing, problems that were already there, but through the pandemics, we look at them anew and, and, uh, and general rehearsal because it's this sort of global mutation. It's this feeling that for the first time, um, at least in our uh, uh, generations, for those who are alive, because no doubt that you know, similar global uh, problems have uh, uh, happened uh, already in the past, but not in a past where we had the ability to talk on Zoom between New York and Lisbon um, <laughs> for free. I'm not even paying to talk with you, Frank. It's yeah. amazing. Uh, so, so we never had a pandemic, a global pandemic in this time when this is possible, this sort of communication. So for sure, this pandemic is very different from the Spanish flu or from the, you know, the plague in, in, in the 17th century or, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very new. And at the same time, it's, it's, uh, it's inaugurating um, a historical 
era of global catastrophe. Now I look very, very pessimistic, but but uh, in a way it's what Bruno Latour is 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 pointing to and telling us also that it, it this this uh, will allow or or give us the chance to to make uh, simple yet radical changes in our lifestyles, in our collective organizations, in our institutions, um, because uh, a general rehearsal is like a lesson we can learn before the opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe that is... Um... When you start a rehearsal, when will it end? Well, how will it at the end look like? But you try your best, but it's a, it's a serious, uh, a most serious uh, a matter. And Latour's idea also that the virus is an actor, right? And uh, that interacts with that, that we are no longer at the center of uh, the ecosphere, that we are part of it and we are refusing to understand it. And that this is a big, big lesson that it's now all of a sudden almost like in theater like an ensemble play it's no longer the star actors it's no longer the written form it's something that is created yeah. together yeah yeah it's it's um you know I'm, I'm i must say that sometimes when i when i hear myself talking about this um i i think sometimes people might misunderstand me and and say well once again here's a guy saying that that this catastrophe might be an opportunity um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm totally allergic to this sort of, you know, neoliberal speech of crisis as, as an opportunity. We, we have lived in austerity in Portugal for almost a decade with heavy, heavy problems, uh, at, in mm -hmm. economical problems, but also uh, with, with, um, with a very uh, uh, harsh uh, um, policy towards uh, social issues. And, yeah. and that changed politically, uh, fortunately, in the last, in the last five years. Um, and, and I must say, I'm, 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 uh, I'm happy it did, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the idea that, you know, this sort of neoliberal mantra of crisis as an opportunity, it always sounds to me as, um, you know, as, a, as an excuse for the states not to uh, protect citizens. Um, and, and it opens the door for me for this sort of entrepreneur, capitalistic uh, behavior um that that uh, many times is you know uh, supported or illustrated with this um lie of the american dream um mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, you know that 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 i think is is sort of perpetuating inequality uh and in injustice and exploitation um on the other hand i always have you know there's this it, there's this very interesting story that uh uh, uh, Slovene philosopher Slavoj Žižek, he quotes in, Žižek in one of his books in uh, a book called Violence. At a certain point, he likes anecdotes a lot, uh, Žižek, and he tells this little story, which is um, during the um, how, 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 how was it called this time? I, I don't I don't remember anymore. The time when um, you know this in the twenties when drinking or selling prohibition um, prohibition times yeah in the united states during the prohibition in the 20s there's this uh, um, anecdote about a journalist that uh, asks a politician about supporting or not the prohibition um and and the the politician is always trying to evade the answer and at a certain point the journalist says please tell me do you support or not the prohibition for instance of wine of selling wine and then the politician answers this beautiful legendary answer, which is, if you're talking about the wine that destroys marriages, turns men into animals and, and vicious beings that, uh, you know, hit each other and steal and, and, and go against any civil rule, I'm, I'm, of course, in favor of the prohibition. But if you're talking about the wine that makes every dinner a marvelous experience and that has an amazing taste and reminds us that life is a, tr is a sort of a, a, a trip of pleasure, uh, then I'm totally against prohibition. Uh, and, and, and that's uh, when people talk about the opportunity in, in the crisis, that's, that's a bit where I stand. Uh, if you're talking about the opportunity that will keep on you know, uh, uh, perpetuating inequality, of course, I'm against the opportunity. If you're talking about the crisis as this historical event that reveals or underlines 
uh, uh, important issues and might push us into different ways of living together uh, in a more just society, then yeah, let's go for the opportunity. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll see how what how will the theater react and how should it react? I mean, you you also found answers in very complex dramaturgy, complex texts, and writing like in your uh, Antony and Cleopatra way, in the simplicity and the beauty of the staging. But also part of your work, as you talked about burning the flag or that Wiener Festwochen project, uh, Katharina and the uh, beauty of killing fascists, you know, which is a very very clear uh, political. Uh, play maybe talk a little bit how do you what is that po politics and pol what do we need well i i think i think it's i mean i i don't i can only talk for myself yeah please. as a spectator or, or or as an artist i'm very doubtful of, of um, any dogmas on, on, on these issues in, in the arts. I can't avoid um, uh, the political views I have, or let's even say political questions because I have more questions than, than, than views uh, when it comes to politics, but I can't avoid that they're somehow present in my work. Uh, in different degrees, sometimes in a very uh, invisible, you know, second, third level of, of understanding of a play, and sometimes more explicitly. Um, but they're always somehow present. But the same thing with, with, with poetry. Uh, I, I cannot do a play, for instance, I, I was never able to do a real documentary theater piece uh, even when I thought of doing one, because halfway I, I, I always felt it was way too um, dry um, in the sense that it missed manipulation and fiction and, and playfulness. And, you know, I, I, for a couple of years I worked as a journalist. Um, and the reason I abandoned journalism, besides the fact that I was not great at it, was the, was you know, the, the tendency to being objective, which is never the case, I realized later, I, I could have stayed in journalism, they're never objective. But, but, uh, but I, back then I thought that was one of the aims of journalism. And I, and I, and I didn't want that for my life. Uh, I wanted to be tremendously subjective. Uh, and and uh, so I started, you know, choosing more theater over, over journalism, but I still use a lot of tools of journalism when I'm when I'm preparing or doing a piece, I, I research like a journalist. I, I you know I have my sources. I meet with people. I try to learn about issues and make casts learn about issues they didn't know. Um, uh, we have lessons together, and you know we 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 approach creating a piece uh, as a as a a small degree on a certain subject or several subjects. And um, but then I need the you know the sub subjective, um, mysterious uh, approach that art allows better than other, you know, human activities. Um, this percentage of mystery that you can never really explain in a piece, I'm very seduced by it and being part of that. Um, this being said, I think like in, in current times, uh, one of the things that is really, you know, uh, uh, passioning for me in coming back to theater after a few months without being able to really rehearse or present performances is that I also think, but this is very, very, very personal. I, I, I don't want to extend this to any other artist, but I think that the audiences might need complexity right now and might need uh, amb ambiguous uh, approaches to things or codes um, I think for, for a, a few months, but it, it feels almost like years already, uh, we, we were hit with, you know, black and white numbers, very concrete numbers, um, unable to know what tomorrow would look like. And tomorrow again was translated in numbers of, of victims, of infected people, of recoveries, 
of you know, potential cases and, and, and everything became so concrete and so uh, um, plain, so dry that uh, I think people are, are you know, um, desperate for, for ambiguity and complexity and codes. So in that sense, I think that's one of the things I want to develop the most in theater right now is uh, ambiguity, complexity. Uh, so even in a play like the one we're rehearsing now, Katharina and the Beauty of Killing Fascists, that seems to have a very explicit title, uh, we're, we're looking for, for dilemmas to offer the audience, for difficult topics uh, and difficult choices for the audience to, to face, uh, and not necessarily a, a pamphlet or a manifesto or a political standpoint that has to be like, uh, you know, propelled in an evangelic way. Uh, not at all, we, we're, we're dealing with very hard questions. We're, we're asking questions about, um, they're old questions, but I think we have to ask them today and you. Uh, questions like, how should, you know, a tolerant democracy lead, lead, deal with intolerance? Should we be intolerant towards intolerance, uh, thus preserving democracy, or should we be, you know, consequent and be tolerant, even with those who will ultimately uh, corrupt uh, democracy and destroy it from within? Because them being intolerant, they have, you know, the open highway to the power. Um, so th these are questions that people like, you know from Malcolm X to Rousseau to, I don't know, to so many people, Hannah Harent uh, um, mm -hmm. asked. It's, I think it's, it's questions we should ask again when we're, when we're facing the, you know, the, the race to power or even the, the, the being in power of, you know, extreme radical uh, uh, white ring, I mean, extreme right wing radical populist movements um, mm. I will not go as far as to call them fascists um, in a debate because then I will be quoted as an objective uh, statement, but I can call them fascist in a play uh, mm. because then it will be ambiguous and subjective and maybe wrong, but still interesting to debate. So, yeah. uh, so what, is, what is interesting is that uh, um, if I understand right, the story is, is a family that since generation has killed fascists and the young daughter now has to do her first killing. And uh, so it's basically making her a uh, high school diploma. Yeah. And, uh, how, and she has problems with it. She has moral ethical questions. And, yeah. um, and the idea, as you said, that is things are not black and white. Actually, the people who tell you things are right or wrong, black and white, they are lying. And I think <laughs> the idea in a way to say, we show up to show complexity um, you know, helps us to understand and deal with a world that is complex, full of contradictions. I think Brecht said, um, small-minded people, their, their hallmark is they are not able to think or live in a contradiction. It has to be this or this, but it's not how life is. So, but how did you combine this kind of fictional story of the family that has that proud tradition of killing fetishes and a real case? So what is, maybe tell a bit that of your, this, unique thing that you take existing stories like Bovary, Anna Karenina, or uh, Anthony Cleopatra, and now, this, how, do you how, how do you work? How, what is your dramaturgical idea? Yeah, well, I, I think I'm, 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 a very, uh, um, I'm very attached to the uh, social uh, gathering in theater. So actually, um, things pretty much come out of conversations with actors, with light designers, with you know, set designers. Um, and, and I have the privilege of being surrounded by these people in my daily life. So from these conversations, projects and ideas start to, start to arise. And, and then I, I, do, I, I don't have like a, a method, but uh, I always work in collaboration, which means that uh, for each performance, I, I try to plan a way of building the performance that is, um, you know, customized for that constellation of people. If I have these three actors, which I know already, and this fourth actor, which I don't know yet, but I sort of remember him from these plays, and uh, we have this thing together, and this light designer, then we're going to work in a certain way. I'll give you an example, like Antony and Cleopatra, 
um, I wanted to work with uh, Vito Ruiz and Sofia Diaz. They're, they're a couple of choreographers and dancers in Portugal who do their own work as authors. And they're amazing. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of their work. And it, it had been a long time we had this sort of flirt, this artistic flirt of we should do, do something together one day. And I had a, a, a sort of carte blanche from a cultural center in Lisbon uh, uh, who said like, come here, do a play, whatever you want. Um, and uh, and we, have, we had a little budget. And, and I said to Vitor and Sofia, I would like to do the play with you. And they said, yeah, we would love to do the play with you, but we, we don't want it to be authors. We, we want to do a, a Tiago Rodriguez theater play. We want to perform in one of your plays. And, uh, and I said like, okay, great. So you want to do theater and I, and I want to work with you. What sh shall we do? And, um, and I, I just, you know, Vitor and Sofia, they're an artistic couple, but they're also a couple in real life. So we were having a, a coffee nearby my house and, and, um, and I was telling them about, you know, artistic couples. And I thought of one of the artistic couples I really loved because it was, it, it was like high pressure. Uh, it's Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. Also because they had art, amazing artistic results from that, you know, uh, from that love couple. And, and I was telling them about uh, Antony and Cleopatra, about Mankiewicz film, the Cleopatra and how it almost bankrupt or did bankrupt uh, 20th Century Fox. And, and, um, and uh, you know, I, we were just talking about these couples. And then I said, Antony and Cleopatra is actually my favorite Shakespeare tragedy because it's so, it's such a strange, crazy play. It's so difficult. It has 40 characters. It's, it's a tragedy, but it takes three years to happen. And there's Alexandria and Rome and, you know, and, and he has this writing, which is very filmic, which I adore because it's the first time that Shakespeare writes uh, scenes that happen at the same time in different places. Um, so there's a scene happening in Alexandria, which should happen at the same time as a scene in, in Rome. Uh, and, and, and this sort of thinking in narrative uh, really baffles me. And they said, okay, let's read the piece. And they read the piece, but very clearly, it's an it's a extremely theatrical piece for two dance performers, even if they're great with texts, to handle. I mean, it's, it really asks for trained classical actors um, if you want to do the Shakespeare tragedy. And, uh, but what I like about them is that they're really about music and, um, and, and, and sort of, uh, mathematics of language on stage. They're very playful with repetition of words in their own work. They're about, you know, building games out of words. They take four words and they do a song with a choreography and, and, it's, and it's always very playful and joyful. Um, and, and then I thought, okay, um, now that we read uh, the Shakespeare tragedy, let's meet tomorrow. Uh, and tomorrow you're gonna tell me everything you remember from the reading of today. And then when they told me what they remembered, they would do instinctively what they do on stage, which was like intertwine their thoughts and trying to remember together. And I said like, okay, we have a piece. It's, um, so I'm gonna try to write a text that it's a theater text that I, that, that I would only write for you, for your kind of speech on stage with a lot of repetition, like a mantra of memory of the story of Antony and Cleopatra. And because you're a couple, let, let's try to have Antony and Cleopatra telling the story of the whole thing, as if there's, they, they can see all the characters, but the, but, they, but the other characters aren't there, as if they're remembering themselves. And then we started little by little to sort of develop a language for this piece, a way of writing, a way of performing, a decor, uh, a way of moving on stage that could only be possible um, for these two guys. I would never write Antony and Cleopatra that way if I would be left alone in my cabinet like Eric Ibsen, imagining the whole play with all its details um, all alone. I, I, I actually, whenever I try to write something alone, it's really boring. It's like a school play, very, very badly written. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not able to write something that I, that I'm, that I really appreciate unless I'm, I'm in the studio and working with actors. So that's, that's how um, the poetry, let's say the grammar of, of, uh, of the stage 
uh, discourse is, is developed. And many times uh, there are previous documents. They might be fictional documents like novels that are being adapted or real events. Um, in the case of Bovary, for instance, I, um, mm -hmm. while I was researching to do an adaptation of the novel of Flaubert, I found um, the, the notes, like the transcriptions of the trial of Flaubert when he first published the novel in, in, in a magazine, in chapters. Um, he was accused of uh, immorality and, uh, and, um, and uh, you know, uh, attempts or attacks to the religion and the good morals, etc. So he was being trialed and the, the trial was amazing. Uh, the trial was for four days you had two lawyers that would read from the book and then comment. Like, you know, directors would comment their own film in, a, in the extras. So they would just go like, blah, 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 Flaubert, Flaubert, Flaubert. Now, what does he mean about this? He thinks that he will convince us that he juxtaposes, you know, the, the hate of the state and adultery, thus saying that adultery is revolutionary, blah, blah, blah. And then the defense would say the same thing. And historically, this, this happened. It was lawyers reading a novel out loud and then trying to interpret. And I thought like, wow, this is a very theatrical thing. It's like they're actors, but they, 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 uh, they're outspoken about the subtext of the way they're reading. And, mm -hmm. and then I thought, okay, I'm not gonna adapt the novel. I'm adapting the trial because within the trial, we have the reading of the novel and then we can have scenes of the novel emerging but actually the whole context is the trial. So in that case, the trial, the historical event is, is the frame within which the novel, the fiction emerges. And, um, and, and another example is Sopro, which you mentioned before. Tell us is, about it. Yeah, Sopro was, uh, um, well, I, I met Cristina Vidal 10 years ago when I first worked as an uh, 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 invited artist at the National Theatre in Lisbon. I, it, it was far uh, uh, from, from any of my dreams that I would once be the director of that theatre. And, and when, when I was rehearsing there, uh, a play for the small venue upstairs for the studio, uh, sometimes I would peek uh, into the big venue where the company of the National Theatre was rehearsing. And it was the first time I saw a prompter working. I had heard about prompters um, and I knew there was still a couple of them working at the National Theatre, but I knew it was an extinct, almost extinct job in theatre. Um, so for me, it was a bit like watching a, a living fossil or a dinosaur crossing the street. It was like, wow. Uh, so I watched this rehearsal secretly and instead of looking at the, act, at the actors, I could only look at Christina, the prompt, that would whisper the text, move very quietly behind the actors to whisper without bothering, you know, following everything, taking notes in her, in her scripts. And I, I was really seduced by it. And I introduced myself to her that day. And later in that day, I, I told her I would like to write a play for her. And she really dismissed me with, with you know, with a very paternalistic laughter and saying like, you know, it's, it's crazy. I will never do that. You're, you're just crazy, you just met me. And um, so we, we met several times after that. And every time I would say as a joke, one day I will convince you to go on stage. And then in 2015, I was invited to run the National Theater. So the first time I, I crossed Christina in the halls, I said like, now I'm your director, you will have to accept to do a play on stage. And she said like, well, you might as well fire me because I will never do it. And, and then we started working together. She would be prompting in, in, my, in my pieces, in the pieces I did at the National Theater. And I, I really then uh, uh, realized the, the richness of this job. It's, so it's not only about whispering the text when an actor forgets, it's about knowing the rhythm of each actor, helping them to memorize, um, giving them cues, taking notes of all their movements. So it's a sort of uh, uh, living archive of each performance. It's like a secretary, an advocate, of the author of the text, but also a confidant of the of all the actors. Uh, it's it's a very you know a very important uh, human social presence in in the in a theater uh, group, and it's also a very old uh, uh, job that feels like um, you know anachronic, and at the same time it's the sort of craft uh, uh, craftsmanship 
that we have to preserve because there's this sort of knowledge, the good tradition kept in these jobs, this uh, transmission that can only happen with human contacts that we cannot lose. We can't do it through, you know, through the uh, academics or readings or the, or you know, visiting a museum. It's not that sort of knowledge. Someone has to share it, live it, to to be able to keep on transmitting. Um, so I, I was very seduced by her. And when the Festival d'Avignon invited me to to do a creation for the festival, I thought, well, this is if she's not gonna accept to premiere um, in front of an audience after 40 years of theater in the in in the backstage in the shadows, if she's not gonna accept to be uh, under the lights for the first time at the Festival d'Avignon, I will never be able to convince her again. And after a few hours, I was able to convince her. And and then we 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 created a show actually where um, where we tell the stories of of a prompter, uh, which are also the stories of of, of uh, a theatrical building, an old theater, um, very inspired by the National Theater. Like this fictional prompter is very inspired by the real prompter, which is Cristina. So she's on stage and she's prompting the whole text of the play which is her personal stories, but she needs actors to tell her story because that's the convention. She cannot ever address the audience directly. So she will whisper to actors all these different stories of uh, her past. And these stories are real stories from the backstage of theater, but they're mixed, messed up with fictional stories. So you have the story of an actor that suddenly we don't know anymore if if this actor is a real person or Vershinin from the Three Sisters by Chekhov because the stories are mixed because of course in the memory of a prompter the the real stories are always mixed with um, with the fiction with theater um, and it's sort of this this um, yeah this ghostly visits to to the past of a prompter, to the past of theater, but also um, a sort of, you know, exercise of, of memory in a theater in ruins, as if things are soon to be over. And we have to use the last minutes of memory to remember everything. Mm. No, well, really, really, thank you for sharing, I'm sure you, you had to tell it so many times, but we haven't seen it uh, in, in the US. And I think that that idea of a theater as a theme of itself, um, the idea of a complex uh, a story, uh, dramaturgically dense, uh, written uh, in collaboration and in the, that is theatrical, but then also that, that simple stage design from what I could see, you know, just the yeah, chair yeah. or table or a backer where actually the play also happens in the mind um, of the audience. It's not that what we see so often here is still, you know, the realistic representation of a living where everything could be filmed for TV. And uh, so it is quite a poetic uh, combination, what, what you found. And uh, do you think for, we call it TAC for the time after COVID, uh, um, w will you find an adaptation for this? Will you think it will be smaller spaces, bigger spaces? Do you think I'm gonna get back in the big city? Is you gonna go outside the building? Are there, are there things where you, you detect a change in the way Portugal or Lisbon will present theater to, to, to the people? Well, in I think a, a few things are, are changing, but uh, the real changes are still happening. So uh, what I mean is that I was faced a lot with the question either by journalists or colleagues during during the, the you know the confinement and even now uh, how do you think this changes theater um, and well what my prophecies are, are quite useless uh, I could share them but they're useless because we will only really be able to think about that when we when we are back doing theater because we cannot imagine this change without an audience we have to imagine it in theater and that's for me, one of the huge differences with the performing arts and, and other arts is that um, I think the, the, the huge change in visual arts will be already be operating right now in literature for sure, 
but in the performing arts, it will have to be invented still uh, when we can share with an audience, however, a space. And, and for a while, we will be reinventing this connection. One thing I realized is that people, at least right now, they're eager to be uh, sharing a physical space. Uh, however, uh, uh, you know, um, however strange the mask and the distance which are imperative um, might feel. Uh, however, uh, um, we, we miss the, the freedom of connection that we are used to in a, in a theater building. I think people are valuing a lot the physical presence in the same space. That's something I witnessed already as an actor sharing uh, uh, um, a, a theater venue with an audience. Um, there's this sort of militant excitement of being there, as if being there is already an artistic political event, uh, which I, I think well, always was, but, uh, but right now it's underlined. I, I don't know how long this boost of energy will last, but, but I think it will last for a while. As long as it's difficult to be together, we will appreciate being together. Um, on the other hand, I think that, uh, you know, theaters, directors, producers, we're all thinking differently in the sense that we always think of a plan B. So before we had plan A and it could go well or bad, we, it could be a success or not, appreciated or not, good reviews or not, uh, a happy artistic uh, working process or not. And right now it's, it might not happen and you need a plan B. What will happen if you can't do it? How will you do it if you can't do it? So it's, it's this interesting thing of, if you can't do what you're, what you're planning, how will, we, how will you do it anyway? And I think we're, we're becoming a plan B species. Maybe again, we always were. I mean, the, the ability to adapt of the human being is, is, is almost limitless, but uh, now it's from the root. When, whenever we have an idea, we start immediately working in, in, in the plan B for that idea. And this I find, I must say, interesting because sometimes the plan B is better than plan A. Um, uh, and so I think, of course, you know, uh, open air performance, uh, small audiences, site specific, uh, they, will, they will gain a, a new meaning now. And I think they might become even more mainstream than before. I think we will have more uh, big venue artists considering um, site-specific uh, circuits um, and other other formats for their for their work. Uh, I, I was raised in a in in the lack of conditions to work, so I'm I'm very much passionate about big buildings and big stages because. Mm -hmm for a long time, I could not work in those. So as long as if I can keep on working in, in big buildings, I'm, I'm happy to do that. But, uh, but I'm also, I mean, I, I did pieces in facades of buildings, in, in gardens, in, in uh, you know, warehouses, and, and I'm, I'm happy to go back to those places or find new places if they allow me to do theater. Um, I think, uh, um, yeah, I think this, this, the, 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 I mean, it's the, the range of options is as wide as always, but I think more people are considering more artistic options and frames where to build their performances than before because they were forced to. Let's say that right now it's harder to be a typical Italian theater director or a typical site specific director, or I think people will consider more options right now and, and won't uh, let architecture condition so much what their artistic uh, style or options or aesthetics or ethics are. Mm. So they will be like Isaiah Balin said, more like rabbits running over the field in different places and the hedgehog who goes very deep down into one thing. What, what's your idea about uh, the in that, in that, zoom for the um, Isaiah Berlin in that Isaiah Berlin comparison of the hedgehog okay. and the fox. I'm I'm I was always for the fox. Always I'm, for the fox. Yeah, I, I think theater people are foxes in general. Yeah. Uh, I think people who write one thousand pages novels like James Joyce or David Foster Wallace, they're the hedgehogs. We yeah. work for you know a couple of months if we're lucky, 
if we have that time in a performance, which we will perform, perform as much as possible while we create the next one. So I think in theater, we're pretty much foxes. We are, we are foxes, yeah, but that is right. And uh, so, but the, the digital world, you know, the, as we say, now we have the children of the digital age and no longer the technological one. What, what do you think about screen and performance? Computers, laptops, projections at home. I think, oh, that's a difficult question, Frank. Um, because uh, I've been dealing a lot with screen, of course, uh, um, as many of us. I think uh, all over the world, in, in Portugal, I could witness it also. When the confinement started for many of us, um, performing arts artists, theater artists jumped in their computers uh, and kept on trying. I think most of this trying is uh, is uh, has a very you know common banal maybe even uh, artistic result, but it comes from something which I think is very beautiful, which is this sort of immediate response and attempt. And I'm I'm a big fan of imperfect attempts. Um, I like you know drawings with pencil better than. Uh, the, the, the huge painting already produced after years. That the drawing it has this unperfectness, this roughness of life, of theater, of of the attempt. I, I'm uh, always more seduced by it as a as a spectator, but also as an artist, than by the perfect, um, you know, uh, um, sublime sometimes, but perfect obedience to the perfect way to do it. Um, I think theater allows for mistake every time it happens and trying to hide the potential of mistake is, is not the most interesting thing. I think the interesting thing is always remind ourselves that the mistake is there and probably we did it already or we'll do it in the next minute of performance. So this danger is what I'm very seduced about in, in, in theater and the performing arts. Um, so I think in somehow, um, although I, you know, most of my work is also um, pretty much based and pointing with a big neon flashlight arrow to uh, physical presence in the same space, I find that paramount for my work. I was also very surprised with very interesting things um, that emerged from the huge uh, sort of uh, avalanche of, uh, of uh, digital online uh, attempts that we saw during the confinement. But I think we cannot um, confound, we cannot mix up, um, you know, serious artistic researches with digital tools with the sort of desperate, beautiful, crazy, maybe very fragile, precarious attempt of some artist that's close at home and takes you know, a skull and go for, you know, for a, for a, for a Shakespearean monologue online on Zoom um, with all his books and things behind him. Um, so I think, I think uh, you know, there are very good ideas that were already being developed um, in, the, in the, you know, in the border between theater and digital arts and, uh, and online platforms before the pandemics. I think they will evolve more urgently now and I think a lot of artists, like with the spaces where to present, will turn their attention to digital tools. Um, while before they didn't feel that need, I think means of production and historical context always pushes us into creative solutions. So if now digital might be a life savior, for sure more artists will turn to it. I must confess personally, although I understand that. Um, I, I, I'm less and less interested in digital possibilities for my work. Um, I'm very interested, for instance, in, uh, in the problem of very little audience. This I like very much. If you want to do physical share of same space, you will have to work for 20, 30 people. I, I want to explore that potential more than going digital and, and having the possibility of a very democratic uh, across the boards, 5,000 people all over the world watching my work. Um, it's not a, a, a political thing. I really admire P 
people who tend to digital and and feel that they're free to do their work it's just not it's just not exciting me it's it's like some it's 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 um i mean if you, i love beckett's but i'm not excited into uh, performing or staging beckett's and and i also love racine and racine really excites me and 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 makes me want to go on stage so i that's what i have with online or a very small basement if you if you give me the choice i will always prefer the small basement for 10 people or an apartment or a kitchen than going online although uh, you know, for instance, Force Entertainment from uh, from the UK, they've been doing beautiful, amazing stuff online. Uh, mm. Great performances online. Uh, the Dutch company Cassis, they're doing beautiful things online. I'm sure that we mentioned Milo Rao earlier. I'm sure that Milo will 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 be able to do great things online, uh, but also open air. Or uh, you know, um, I, I I think that many artists will 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 you know um will inaugurate experiences because of the because of the risk of not being able to do to be in a in a theater venue so i think there's a lot of people thinking of that um but it, but it's true that uh, we if if we're going online we have to wish to go online and that's the thing we can't we can't be online out of uh, trends or just the need to express ourselves you can do that a couple of times but if you want to use the digital tools uh, seriously, you have to desire to be online. And I, I, I'm very happy to be online now with you, for instance. But, mm -hmm. uh, but if I'm thinking, if I'm fantasizing about a piece, I'm, I'm always fantasizing about um, unknown people in the same room while we try to do theater. Mm -hmm. In the coming a bit close to the end, but I, but I would like to know then from you, we say, this is not what inspired me, but what is theater good for? What do you think about theater? What does it do? Why, why do we need it? Why, what, is, what is it all about? Well, I think, first of all, I mean, this is like a commonplace. Don't take me, don't take me wrong. I, I'm <laughs> trying to be, to be, you know, um, to be pretentious, but I, I think theater is. Period. So, um, I uh, I understand the problem of trying to understand what is it good for, but that's not a problem for theater. So I think I I can answer that question from the point of view of someone who loves theater, and who sees a point in it. But uh, as an artist, I don't think I have to justify why theater is good for. I'm, I'm just doing theater. If you come and watch it and you're, uh, and you're sort of occupied with this question, what's it, what is it good for? Then, then, it's, then it's your question. Uh, for me, as, as, um, as a spectator, as a, as, you know, as a citizen, or even as an artist, I'm, I'm, um, I'm very touched by the human assembly in it. I'm um, the fact that we're together in the same space um, and that uh, we're uh, facing uh, somehow a mystery, which I think a work of art always is, but it's a mystery that we have to, um, you know, take part in as a spectator, as much as the artists on stage, we have to sort of contribute with our presence for the mystery to exist. I find I find this very powerful. It's something that really uh, changed my life. The fact that I saw theater, um, it it made me closer to the you know to humankind. Uh, the fact that I could share this space. On the other hand, I, I don't think that theater itself is a political uh, uh, tool, although it's a political space. But I think. It's a sort of anti-chamber, uh, a sort of um, hall towards uh, politics and action and change. I, I don't think that it's within the piece that change happens, but I believe that a piece can lead to even, you know, very microscopic changes in the world. 
and when they when they happen and when you witness them happening even however small they are um for me uh, um it's it's you know i could work in theater for you know 50 years of my life um if i would be sure that one of these microscopic changes would take place um so in that sense the idea that you do this useless thing apparently um useless and that change happens um however small but that does happen because of this useless thing i i find incredible um it's it's like smiling and suddenly something changed i i find this very strong uh there's this there's this beautiful story about russian poet anna akhmatova uh she was uh, her 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 husband had been uh, shot by the uh, stalinist regime and her and her son had been arrested and he was sort of a teenager he was 17 or something and she tried to visit him every day in prison but not always succeeded because very long lines of of, of you know thousands of women uh, and akhmatova called them the 3000 women lines because they were so long and one day she was in in a line actually she wrote this at the end of the day and so uh, beginning of quote um i, I was in one of these 3000 women line everybody was whispering none of us would talk loud in one of these lines suddenly someone whispered that's the poet anna akhmatova a woman came to me and clearly she didn't know who i was but she asked me will we will you will you write no will you describe what we're living here in one of your poems and I answered, yes, I will. And then a smile appeared in what once was a face. End of quote. This idea that a poet promises a poem and a smile appears in what once was a face. For me, you know, Anna Akhmatova could stop her uh, amazing body of work in poetry that day um, with this little story. So I, I um, yeah, it's it's uh, I'm inspired by the possibility of change and the usefulness of what apparently is useless and the power of what's invisible and um, and the you know the strength of mystery. Mm. And also the fact that it's such fun to do theater. You know, it, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the philosopher, he, he hated theater. Um, he, he thought it was superfluous, but, but in a wrote in a famous letter to D'Alembert, one of the authors of the Encyclopedia with Diderot, Rousseau writes um, that although it has all the vices in the world or the problems, all the hateful things and vain things of theater, I have to admit it has one big advantage it's a civic party it is a party which i hate but it's a civic party and this idea that this sort of political um uh and 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 playful moment that theater might be this human assembly very greek very athens the the party mixed with politics is is for me uh, it's it's i think it's still what i look for when i do a piece trying to mix the politics with the party. Amazing, yeah. This is a, all the P's like Portugal, right? Poetry, politics, and the party. That's a, yeah, I'm gonna use that. And the prompter oh, with a P. Yeah, party. yeah that's a, that, is, um, that is amazing. And yeah, so we will, so you think you will go back to tomorrow? You, if, if this is now over today, tomorrow you will, make new plans again how to rehearse uh, how to get back with your theater how yeah, people absolutely everything yeah 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 you know one thing uh, uh, we were talking about that during the rehearsals of katarina and the beauty of killing fascists the other day which is uh, sometimes you know uh, artists that work with me are actors and especially set designers and light designers and and costume designers they they go a bit 
um, they, they stress a bit with uh, my ability to proc procrastinate. Um, so I'm, I'm, I deeply believe that you're, you should never take a creative decision unless you really have to. So unless you're way beyond the deadline, you should never take the decision. Um, oh, what lights, this or this? Can we still wait until tomorrow? Yes, but it will be late, but we can wait then tomorrow. Uh, so I always do this. And I always say, this is, this is about the research and the experience. I, I'm not really um, into the business of making the right choice. I'm in the business of living the dilemma. Um, and sometimes, you know, if you let a problem alone enough time, someone will solve it for you. The collective will solve it for you. So now we're right now we have a text in this piece, which is very controversial because it's a, it's a fragment. I, I wrote a, a sort of fascist speech for a character, but it's a long speech and it's really fascist. I mean, I, I did my research. I, uh, and it's, it's this sort of, it, the idea was to uh, uncover the fascism within the populist speeches. So I was inspired. I, I saw like dozens of speeches by Trump, Bolsonaro, Viktor Orban from Hungary, Salvini in Italy, Marine Le Pen in France, Portuguese extreme right wing, which I will not name because I don't think they deserve yet to be named. Um, and, and, and I tried to mix all this and make this sort of perfect fascist speech, but not really fascist because it's fascist under the veil of populism. And, and when we read it, the, the actors were really shocked. And, and some of them were like, I'm not sure I can, I can do a performance where this text is. And I said like, yeah, but you could do a performance where someone would historically say, uh, you know, a Nazi speech, um, yeah. as long as if it's clear that the, the play is anti-Nazi. Well, clearly, but here, this is so today that, and it's so dangerous because people are appealed by this speech. And I said like, yeah, but the people had the same appeal for Hitler. Uh, so we, we have to deal with this. And we were discussing it a lot. And now we still don't know if it will be in the play and people are getting very nervous about it. They're probably, some of them are listening to our conversation um, and, and they're very nervous about it. Will, will it be on the P? Won't it be? And of course, for me, it's always a collective decision. I won't have text in the piece that actors do not engage with. So uh, I'm, uh, we're, we're debating about this, but, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm just postponing as much as possible because um, it's not so much that the text will be there, but the dilemma that we're living now, what can you do? How far can you go as an author or as a collective of artists taking such speech on stage for such a long time when, when it comes to extreme right wing, we're only used to the you know, sound bites, but we don't spend half an hour listening to them. Well, I did. And it's really very efficient what they do. Half an hour of one of these populists talking can, can really, really convince you. And, and, uh, and uh, of course, I always think that the audience is as smart or smarter than me. Um, so I think we can expose them to this because I, I exposed myself and I was not converted. I just appreciate the efficiency and the you know, ability of the rhetorics, even when they're not very good even when they're mm -hmm. not eloquent, they're amazing. I mean, Trump yeah. is a good example. He's really not eloquent, but he's so efficient. He's amazing. His he's like really really performance is crazy. Uh, like the Lenny Riefen style films are incredibly yeah. effective. Yeah, and, uh, yeah we absolutely. To, we have to admire it. Listen, um, so, 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 yeah. yeah. So, but I was telling you, just to finish, one of the things they, they you know, people were very, um, uh, uh, stressed with was this my my sort of tranquility towards you know time being passing and not taking decisions and I always say this is about the experience let's leave the problem let's not find the solution too soon because I mean when it comes to the arts the, the solution sometimes it's just like the extreme end of the problem and then you show the problem to the audience instead of solving it and hiding it and and now with the pandemics everything is so uncertain that all the actors are like, when I say like, let's not decide yet if we have this speech or not, we'll see later, we still have time. We always have time. Even after the opening of the show, we can change stuff. And actors are really like, yeah, of course, this is just about the process. It's not about the result, let's live the problem. And I think a lot of people 
lost their obsession with the efficiency and production, uh, at least in the arts, in the context where I deal with, uh, because of these pandemics. They sort of accepted that uh, we have to, you know, seize the moment when it comes to creation. We have to live today's problem and, and, uh, and, and believe that it's in us, in our skills, in our technical skills, in our creativity, that a work of art will emerge that will translate this problem instead of solving it way too early and hiding it from the audience. Hmm. Hmm. So time, the feeling of time, I think, the use of time, I think it changed for, for many artists, at least those who surround me, I, I really feel that. I, I feel more company in the frame of mind of, you know, let's just live the problem. And, you know, art is about uh, translating our problems, not about solving them. Yeah, and actors and directors in the way they are, the translators of great, great texts. And it's great, yeah, what might change? And someone said that Kemi here in New York uh, from the Laundromark Project, I collaborated, that we do all this, but now we say, hey, how are you? You know, on the same yeah. time, which we didn't ask before. We yeah. nobody did. It was changing. We are so close to it. I mean, we're a bit over time, but I, we, that was so significant what you had to say. If there's something for young artists or the young Tiago who is starting out and, you know, just creating his company, you know, what, what do you say to artists now? What should they do? Or to our listeners, use that time. What do you think is of, essential, of, is of essence? What's essential? The attempt. The just don't wait for the big canvas and the big opportunity and having all the different you know colors in your palettes and all and being able to draw perfectly just do a lot of do a hundred drawings in a napkin just just go for it take a broken pencil from the floor that someone forgot and and do your thing um so i think in theater this means you know find the text, learn it by heart during the evening and, and just go for it and, and find someone's kitchen where you can present your work to three people. And, and, but don't wait for the, for the big canvas to, to be ready to, to, you know, to in, don't wait for invitations. Just take whatever you have around you. And if you, if you feel the urge and the desire, just, just you know, practice, do as much as possible. I, 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 it, this isn't, it has nothing to do with the present time. It's the only thing that I, that I always, you know, that I always learned. You, you should fail as much as possible and, and just, you know, uh, it sounds like a Nike commercial, <laughs> just do it. But, um, mm -hmm. but Nike stole it from, from artists and revolutionaries. Um, it's, you know, you should, accept how imperfect our attempts at art are. We will never touch uh, the heights of Sophocles. It's, we will never touch the heights of Shakespeare or Racine. And that's liberating. We will only be noise. We will surely only be noise. And for a very short time, so let's let's um, you know profit from the party and the civic side of it, and do a political party, noisy one, mm -hmm. and and and, uh, and not wait for posterity or to be legitimized by you know critics or m massive audiences. Just take all the napkins, all the butts of pencils that you can use, and keep on drawing your little attempts. Uh, be it in theater, literature, film, um, and and things will follow or not. Mm. That's that's a significant, great series and deep, uh, deep, deep advice of a broken pencil idea. I, I like that instead of this broken window thing, but police people say, you know, you have one broken window, the neighborhood goes down. They say, you know, someone will go in, someone will break, then drugs, you know, the neighbors will sell the house. But you say, take a broken pencil, and it will, everything will change. It's, and it's, um, it's true. I like very much what you said for your rehearsals to say, you know, live the experience and don't have the immediate solution. And this is what we have now also. I think this is a time when you're right. We have to live this experience um, 
where we are in now, and um, and uh, and it's uh, it's 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 a um, time where we we look for change. We have to change authentically, but also be, you know be ready, or as you said, that chamber before the change and the activism. Maybe that is a great description. Yeah, I mean, the incubation about... period, you know, I think uh, uh, Susanna Kennedy talked about that, you know, that it's something where you, something incubates and, um, and shows it, yeah. Yeah, I think most of us don't create much. Uh, so um, I, I think we have to accept that and, and you know, know that uh, if you're moved by desire and urgency, um, then you will, like Rilke said uh, to the young poets, you will write, uh, you don't need my approval to do so. If you can live without writing, then quit. But mm -hmm. if you need writing poems to live, yeah. it won't be me, uh, Rilke or you, Frank, or any other person that will stop an artist with its urgency and desire. However bad an artist he or she might be, they won't be stopped by our warnings. Um, so just go for it. Because uh, I mean, I, I did lousy pieces of theater in my life, really things that I'm ashamed. I'm, I'm very honest. I, and now I'm a bit better. Hmm. And so yeah. I mean, not all of us can can be like Aunt Teresa de Kesmarker and do, uh, you know, um, historical play at the age of 23 with the Rosas Danced Rosas and change the, you know, the landscape of global uh, contemporary dance. Um, very few artists are that amazing and, and, and such genius at such young age and throughout their lives like Aunt Teresa always was with, with dance. I mean, most of us are not that great and some of us get a little bit better with time but uh, if you have the urge and the desire, you know, just make some noise. Yeah. It's like, uh, I think uh, it's that Fernando Pessoa poem a friend once uh, sent me about the three things. There's always a beginning it, as about certainty. You know, there's a beginning a certainty. You have to go further and a certainty that you will be interrupted. You will yeah. not finish it. And then you have to make something out of it in the, in the later part of it really, 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 thank you. This was a, a you, really, uh, significant contribution. It's for us also important to hear you as a European theater artist and the way you think and collect and the, the poetry, the literature, the art world. So this is a, a great reminder about uh, the, what theater really in a way is about or can do. And uh, we hope one day you will come to New York, um, stay in touch and uh, do, do the good work and uh, really, um, that was a, a significant uh, contribution. And, uh, and I hope for our listeners, and thank you for taking your time. We went a little bit over time, but it's really worse that there might be something that changes your life or what Tiago told about that little change. What, you, what he said was very significant also for our lives and to take action and to maybe see theater as a chamber where you as audience members think about and make connection and then you create something. It's not about the theater, it's about what you see and it, how you connect it to your life and, uh, and hopefully contribute to, to, to a change. It's a, a stunning um, um, a work you're doing. Really, congratulations and uh, thank you for sharing. Tomorrow we have Carrie Dad Switch with us. She will uh, talk about the Latino, Latinx, Latina community here in New York City. She's a playwright, translator, essayist, and has a watch that seemed had uh, also uh, created many, many symposia and uh, and 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 uh, um, convened since uh, con con many. Um, what's the right word? You know, gatherings of of, of artists. And uh, where we now struggle with, and we have to all pay more attention to the Black Lives Matter and that all communities of colors need more attention. And, uh, and we really uh, look forward to hear what Carrie Dadi will have to say. So thank you for um, uh, joining us all. Thanks for HowlRound for uh, hosting us again, VJ and Sia and Travis Siegel team is Andy and San Yang and Tiago Help. Uh, so lucky us we had you that you didn't have to go back to the theater today. So we were happy to, uh, have you in the last day of lockdown and uh, really thank you i can really only imagine how uh, how um, busy you are and um, so it's a big compliment that you that you took the time so it was, uh, it was a big pleasure thank you so much frank and thank you to everyone watching and uh, 
and uh, hopefully we'll we'll be able to meet again and exchange ideas and and cross our paths in the future and hopefully in 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 person in safer times. Okay, thank you, Tiago. Bye bye. Bye bye.